a senior columnist at the Daily Beast, Matt Lewis. Matt, good morning. Uh, before we dig into your latest piece titled Trump and Ramaswamy show us uh, how the worst get to the top, parse through some of what he was saying last, yesterday with Chuck. I mean, we heard a lot of that at the debate the other night. Does he believe any of that? I mean, he's a smart guy, without question. It sounds very cynical to most people listening that he's trying to sort of impersonate Trump, be a stand-in for Donald Trump. I like the Ramaswamy who wrote the book like two years ago, who made some very yeah. good points. Not as much the Ramaswamy today, who is contradicting and flip-flopping on all those points. And uh, look, he is a very, obviously, a very intelligent person. He's very eloquent. Uh, he can go on TV and express himself uh, very well. And then it's only after you, you unpack the points he makes that you realize um, most of them are kind of BS. Um, so, for example, the idea that Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, had the, uh, the power to tell states who, by the way, run elections, you know, that, that Mike Pence had the constitutional power to tell these states they had to do in-person voting and that they had to have paper ballots and all of these things. And that it was Mike Pence's responsibility, not Donald Trump's response. Remember, Donald Trump is telling people, don't do mail-in voting, which, again, interestingly, Vivek actually did mail-in voting. Later on, Chuck Todd asked him how he voted in 2020. He didn't vote in person. He did mail-in voting, and he cited a global pandemic as the reason why he did mail-in voting. Well, maybe that's why a lot of other people did the same thing. So, uh, again, if you just listen to him, maybe you're flipping the channel or, or something. He sounds incredibly compelling and eloquent. Uh, but when you start to unpack the things he's saying, they usually don't really hold water. And that's what happened on the debate stage as well. When he said, cut off all the funding for Ukraine, I'd issue a preemptive pardon for Donald Trump and climate change is a hoax. In the case of yesterday's interview with Chuck, Chuck just read his book back to him and said, well, that's not what you were saying two years ago in your book. In your piece, Matt, you write this, quote, how is it that tech bro Vivek Ramaswamy, a self-described skinny kid with a funny name who's never held public office, rarely even votes, and has been on both sides of numerous issues, became the hottest commodity in the Republican Party. How was he considered one of the big winners of Wednesday night's debate, despite his unctuous and demagogic performance? If you want my honest answer, why should we expect anything less? The concomitant buzz surrounding Ramaswamy reminds us the problem isn't Trump per se, but a culture that rewards and incentivizes Trumpian behavior. Once you understand and accept this reality, it's easier to make political predictions regarding the GOP. Who wins? The people who have no sense of shame, the people who are willing to kiss your butt or slit your throat, depending on the circumstances. The real danger, Matt writes, is not Ramaswamy or Trump, but what our enthrallment with politicians like them says about one of our two major political parties. And so where does that leave then, Matt Lewis, someone like Nikki Haley, who a lot of people think had a good night the other night, or Mike Pence or Chris Christie, who's been the most openly critical of Donald Trump, who are trying to in many ways, go about this like a conventional presidential campaign and watching Donald Trump and Vivek Ramaswamy rise next to them. Well, look, on one hand, Willie, I think if you watch that debate, you could say, um, hey, there's hope, right? If you are a Reagan Republican, if you're a freedom conservative, if you're someone who believes in kind of limited government and traditional conservative values, not the quote unquote new right, you might have watched that debate and concluded, hey, everything's great. Uh, you know, Chris Christie did a great job of supporting Ukraine against Russia's invasion. Mike Pence uh, rhetorically did a great job. And I think Nikki Haley did a fantastic job. She, I believe, overperformed certainly my expectations. So you might have watched that debate and concluded things are pretty good. And, 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 uh, and if Trump were to disappear, we might be in OK shape. The Republican Party might come back. The problem is if you start to actually add up the polling and consider who's winning, uh, something like 75 or 80 percent of Republican voters are supporting either Donald Trump, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy or Ron DeSantis. So it's, you know, the, the, the people that we've mentioned here, the Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, uh, Chris Christie, that's like maybe 20, 21 percent of the vote. Um, and so uh, maybe it's not as cheery as the debate made it look. And the last thing I would add, uh, Willie, is, is the attention economy. 
uh, right now. Who is getting the attention and the buzz and the excitement? It's Vivek Ramaswamy. He is winning that argument, uh, or at least that that part of the campaign right now. And uh, you know, in my piece, I talk about uh, this high, famous Hayek book, of course, "The Road to Serfdom," and he mm -hmm. he talks in it. He has a chapter that talks about why the worst get on top. He was talking about totalitarian regimes where, like, the old Soviet Union, uh, it's it, it's not uh, Trotsky who ends up, you know, succeeding Lenin, right? It's it's the worst. It's Stalin. It's someone who's willing to do whatever it takes to win. Obviously, we are blessed that we do not live in that kind of regime here in America. But I think that the dynamic is is similar. That it is the worst people in the Republican Party right now who are more likely to do what it takes to get to the top.